Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Soldiers of Sidelines Commander in Chief Trophy Series webinar, getting ready for the upcoming Air Force Army game here on November 5th at uh, Globe Life Field in Texas. And uh, we have two amazing guests here to talk about football leadership and uh, transitions as, as we always do here. And uh, I am so excited to announce our two guests. Uh, first, uh, representing the Army Black Knights, uh, we have uh, Soldiers to Sidelines uh, supporter, advocate, friend, and uh, hell of a football player and leader in Rob Dickerson. Uh, Rob was born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware, and was number eight of nine children. One of the many things Rob learned from his parents, Ed and Doris, was that for the Dickerson team to be successful, you had to be mindful of everyone else on the team and work well together. And that's going to be evident when we start looking at uh, Coach Dickerson's football film. It was those kinds of lessons that served him well later in life. Sports was always something Rob engaged in starting at an early age and throughout his life. Rob was a three-sport varsity athlete in high school playing football, baseball, and basketball. And following high school, Rob attended Fork Union Military Academy in 1982 for a postgraduate year and played tight end for the FUMA team, Fork Union Military Academy. So Fork Union prepared him well for his next destination, which was West Point. Rob was a four-year starter, starter at U.S. Um, the Military Academy, playing in 46 straight games and was a member of the winning Army Cherry Bowl and Peach Bowl teams. Some of that footage from the Peach Bowl we're going to see here tonight. Uh, Rob was also an All East and AP Honorable Mention All-American selection. After graduation from West Point, Rob served for 30 years as an Army aviator and retired from the Army in 2017 with his last Army job being West Point's Deputy Athletic Director. He and his wife Shelly now reside in Dallas, Texas and now enjoying playing their favorite sport, which is grandparenting. So can't wait to hear all those lessons. So uh, welcome, Rob. Thanks. Great to be here tonight, Harrison. So excited for this conversation. And so representing the other side of the ball and the Air Force Academy is the famous Chad Hennings. And uh, if you guys aren't familiar with, with Chad Hennings, uh, you should be. Uh, so he was an incredible football player for the Air Force Academy and actually played in the same time that Rob played and they played against each other. Uh, Chad won the Outland Trophy, which is the award given to the best collegiate interior lineman. And uh, he, he achieved that his senior year in 1987, then ultimately got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. So what's really impressive is after graduating from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1988, Headings entered the undergraduate pilot training at Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita. Top Falls, Texas, as part of the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Program conducted by the 80th Flying uh, Training Wing. And that's important because he was drafted in the 1988 draft as well. So imagine being drafted in the NFL and not going to the NFL to serve your time uh, in the Air Force. So Ian uh, JJP is an elite program, and when his ground training studies faltered, he had been an honor student at AFA. His squadron commander isolated him from all contact regarding the Dallas Cowboys. So that was like the, the big issue here. Um, however, uh, Hennings completed lead in fighter training, and because of his size, was eligible only for the F 11 or F 111, F 15 Eagle, and A 10 Thunderbolt 2. He became an A-10 pilot and was signed to the 92nd Tactical Fighter Squadron, a unit of the 81st Tactical Fighter Wing based at RAF Bentwaters in the United Kingdom in June 1990. So eventually he comes back, winds up becoming an incredible starter for the Dallas Cowboys. He is in the ring of fame uh, at this very moment and now serves in the community on so many different levels as just being uh, an incredible per person and a phenomenal supporter of Soldiers of Sidelines. So, Chad, uh, you know, we are humbled and honored to have you with us tonight. Great to be here, guys. Look forward to it. Awesome. So before we get started, for you guys who don't know me, I'm Harrison Bernstein, founder and executive director of Soldiers to Sidelines, and I will be facilitating uh, a, a discussion here. Now, coming right, right off the get-go, guys, I want to know a little bit about how you got to the military academies, right? So both of you grew up in, you know, kind of rural areas or areas that aren't, uh, 
I want to say like heavily recruited, like, like some of the bigger cities, like Dallas, for instance, right now. So in your smaller communities, you, you were tremendous athletes. Like Rob, you were three time, you know, I mean, you were three sport athlete, uh, you know, Chad, your accolade precedes you. How, how did you get into West Point? What made you decide to go there? And then Chad, what made you decide to get into the Air Force Academy? So since I asked both you guys the same question at the same time, Chad, take it away. I was just going to say, Rob, age before beauty, sir. You're your time. <laughs> you're the senior statesman here. <laughs> go ahead. I'll go last. All right. Okay. All Back right. over to you. Okay. Well, you know, you always want the army to set the example, anyway. But, uh, <clears throat> but uh, you know, I mine's not a big like uh, light bulb moment. I uh, it was it was uh, I would also almost say fateful that I ended up at the United States Military Academy. But to be honest with you, in high school, I didn't even really know what it was. But growing up, I had this, you know, I was a guy that always watched uh, military movies. I read a lot of military books, uh, even thought potentially that, you know, one day I, I might even join the service. But, you know, uh, I went to a vocational, what they call Votech High School. And um, uh, it was a big school uh, and we had some good good teams. So I got recruited in high school, but because I wasn't taking uh, any type of uh, college prep courses, uh, you know, an English teacher had recommended to, to me that I go to Fort Union Military Academy. And there's a lot of athletes uh, that uh, go down there to take college prep courses to get their SATs up. And that's kind of why I went down there. And then while I was at Fort Union, um, I, uh, we had a really good team, Don McCaskey, magic man from Green Bay Packers was our, was our quarterback. Uh, I got recruited, uh, uh, one of them was from the United States military Academy. I took a trip up to West point. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but, but to be honest with you, Harrison, what it really came down to, uh, was, uh, you know, I thought so much of my father and my father never served, but out of all the schools that were recruiting me, he said, you know, Rob, I think the best school for you would be West Point. So uh, I kind of came to that conclusion myself. Uh, I think that Fork Union prepared me well. And I think my uh, that, that team mentality we had as the Dickerson clan, uh, my love of military stuff growing up, uh, like I said, was kind of eventually put me there at West Point. Great one. Um, yeah, and it sounds like you had a bunch of influences there. So, so Chad, uh, in, in, in Iowa, what brought you to the Air Force Academy? You know, it sounds story similar to Rob. So I wasn't highly recruited coming out of high school. I had some nibbles. I went to a very small high school, like 125 kids in my graduating class. I would received some nibbles from like uh, Iowa State University. You know, this was back in the day when the internet wasn't even invented yet. Al Gore hadn't gotten around to invent the internet yet. So you get the postcards and I received the postcard from the Air Force Academy saying, hey, we're interested in you. You know, you kind of fit our criteria. You know, would you be interested in coming And I had a conversation with my high school football coach between my junior senior year. And he asked what I wanted to do after school. And I said, coach, I, you know, I would love to play, be able to play division one college football, but not being highly recruited. I said, you know, I really, I'm really thinking about going to, would love to go to the air force Academy. My coach took it upon himself unbeknownst to me that summer to compile a 16 millimeter highlight film of me drove out to the air force Academy, 900 miles, delivered it to the, the coach, uh, Mike Gould, who was recruiting that part of, the country for the Air Force Academy and hand delivered him the film and said, you need to recruit this kid. He, he'd be ideal for you. Um, they looked at the film, evidently liked what they saw. And I was the last recruit that they brought in on a visitation um, after I finished wrestling season in Iowa. And that's, that's how I got to the Academy. So it was literally for all you coaches out there, just want to make the big push. You are the difference maker a lot of times in the kids that you coach in their lives. And you may not know it, you may be years later, but you do make a huge impact. And that's why I'm so excited about what Soldier Sideline is doing 
in the community and, and amongst the, our military brethren. Man, Chad, that, that's an amazing story. What was the name of your high school football coach that made that 900 mile trek on your behalf? Yeah, his name is Reese Morgan. He actually went on to coach after that's my high school uh, at Iowa City. He became a Hall of Fame high school football coach and he went to coach 17 years for the University of Iowa. This guy has coached three Outland Trophy winners and uh, um, oh, Dallas Clark. So he would have coached, uh, uh, what is it, the, uh, the, for tight ends. Yeah. Award winner there too. So, I mean, this guy, classic, just a down to earth, awesome technician, awesome coach, awesome motivator. Harrison, could I add something, uh, you know, and my story and Chad's story, you know, I can name hundreds of friends that have very similar stories. The important thing is that whether you know, it was football, baseball, or basketball, not, you know, Chad and I didn't really know what the academy was or even much about it, but the fact that we were recruited athletes, we ended up going to the academies and, and finding out, especially in my case, you know, that this was something that was probably meant to be. And, you know, uh, you know, service your country. Uh, but otherwise, football, I would have never went to West Point without football. Well, and it sounds like you guys wouldn't have done this without your football coaches. And what I, I hear from both you guys, that those are tremendous examples of selfless service. It's like they, they modeled that behavior, passed it on to you guys to then serve our country in the military. And this concept of selfless service got passed down from your coaches into you. And then this, you know, launched your, your careers of selfless service. And, you know, what I want to know from you guys is how has that stuck with you? And now you're paying it forward um, in selfless service. I mean, clearly the low hanging fruit here is all of your support to our soldier coaches, right? You, you guys do that for soldiers of sidelines. But in your communities right now, are there certain examples where, you know, you think of your high school coach and what they've done for you? And is there a way that you're, you know, paying that forward now? You know, for me, I was just going to say, I'll show this picture. These are my two high school coaches. Reese Morgan's there on this side on my left and my other coach, Jerry Eckenrod, my wrestling coach, football coach on my right. I, I wanted to be like these men. I mean, I, for me, these men were my idols. They were my heroes. Aside from my parents, et cetera, these guys were the biggest influences on my life. And a lot of who I am today is because of these men. And, you know, I'll get a little philosophical here. Rob, sit down. I'm going to get talk a little philosophy here. So don't, don't get too out of bed, out of shape there, buddy. All right. But, you know, I, I kind of have this philosophy in life is that when we were younger, we were kind of like those. And you're, when you're in your teens and your 20s, you're one of those individuals that, hey, I'm the freshman on the team or I'm the rookie. I'm trying to figure out who I am. I'm trying to figure out who, how I fit into the scheme, how I, to learn about myself, my strengths, my weaknesses. And then when you get into your 30s and into your mid 40s and maybe beyond into your early 50s, you're, you're kind of like that player coach where, hey, I've, I've been there. I'm experienced. Now it's about, you know, raising up others within the team because I know my success is dependent upon raising others up so that the team succeeds you know a rising tide lifts all ships we got to include the navy guys in here too rising tide lifts all ships but then when you get in your 50s kind of let the age where Rob and I are starting to hit our prime in that like a fine wine now it's all about being a coach now it's all about hey how can I raise others up so for me in my community I'm big into mentorship. I'm trying, I have a lot of individuals that have reached out to me that are separating either from, you know, the NFL or from active duty. And they want to try to figure out life. What's it like? And I'm, I'm telling guys, what you learned as an athlete, what you learned in the military, very comparable, those same lessons in life transition or translate well into a civilian job or civilian equivalent uh, sector. And, you know, so so for me, it's all about, man, now it's about lifting others up and, and being a coach. That, that for me is, is the prime thing that I could do at this point in my life. What a wonderful story. Rob, what's your, what's your reaction to that? Um, uh, Chad, Chad hit the, the nail ahead. You know, just be, uh, you know, his, his path was obviously different from mine uh, with me serving 30 years. So, 
Um, you know, I wore the uniform for a long time, but, you know, as any veteran knows, you know, being in that long and being in the positions that I was, you have to be a coach, you have to be a mentor, you have to be a motivator of the troops within your organization. So, you know, there's uh, on the Army side, there's a very famous uh, saying, MacArthur's message on athletics, upon the fields of family strife or sown the seeds that on other days will bear the fruits of victory. So what, as Chad said, that train from the military over to athletics um, is very apparent. So, you know, I did that for 30 years, coaching and mentoring. Uh, it's something that probably kept me in the military for 30 years because I enjoyed it so much. And it's been a natural transition when I retired in uh, 2017. You know, I'm always talking to, uh, you know, potential uh, athletes that are going to West Point. I still get called up by the coaches to talk to recruits. Um, and it's not just athletes as well. I, I you know, I'm so, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm so proud of, you know, I'm so of, of being, you know, an academy grad and, you know, been fortunate to do the things that I've been able to do. And I want to try to pass that on to others. So, you know, I, I do my best to help others get into uh, the academy. And uh, uh, there's the folks that are, there's some folks on this call are on the Zoom call right now that uh, I see Dan Cooney, Rob Alsis. They've been on calls with me with Coach Young. I mean, Coach Young is 86 years old. And I probably still call him maybe once, uh, once a month or once every other month. And anytime I get together with football players, we always call Coach Young. We just had an event for, for Donnie Smith back in September. He got inducted into the Hall of Fame. And, you know, Coach Shuck showed up. We called Coach Kish. We called Coach Young. So the influence on our, our that the coaches had on us is not only very impactful, but it's 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 pretty much everlasting. Yeah, such an awesome story, and, and it's so great to see some of your teammates here on this call as well. Uh, on both sides, it's, it's just it's such an, an endearing gesture that um, you know this brotherhood lives on. You know, long after. Here, I'm going to share my screen at this moment. I'm going to take a look here at you, Rob. And I, I just couldn't help but think of, you know, the concept of selfless service, right? And like how much those coaches meant to you. And when you look at this film, I want everyone to see it. It's going to be blurry, right? We're showing stuff from the 80s um, and then some clips from Chad in the 90s here. And uh, right off the bat, we're going to look at Rob Dickerson who's going to be lined up right up here at tight end. Okay. Person? Yeah. Uh, you got a gray box over on the left. Oh, thank you. Well, that's what happens when you optimize, it goes away. Okay. So that should have gone away now, but let's take your look at the top of the screen here, right? You know, as an offensive lineman at one of the academies, that alone is one of the selfless positions you could possibly have. I mean, you're just grinding every single day. And we talk about like the evolution of football. I want to tune everyone's attention to, to the four point stance that all the offensive linemen are in right now. Okay. And we're just going to show Rob here at the top of the screen on this play and watch him release. Bandwidth issues. Yeah. Hey, Harrison, we're freezing. Um, you might want to stop your share and, and reshare if you can hear me. Uh, while we're waiting on that, hey, um, uh, Rob or Chad, kind of an open question. What was one of you guys' what was one of your fondest memories of playing at the academy and, and what what really made your your time there special to you? Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, Brady. I, I would say, you know, a lot of people, a lot of times ask, what was your favorite play, favorite game, all that? It was never about that for me. It was always about the relationship with the guys in the locker room. 
that's what it always go back for, whether it was it for Air Force Academy or whether it was the Dallas Cowboys, you know, it's just the guys. That's what it was all about, the relationships. And that's where, for me, you know, it translated so well into active duty, being in a fighter squadron or now in my my role as a commercial real estate, having my own company. It's, it's all about the relationships with individuals and, and controlling that culture. So for me, that's, that's my fondest memory. And we actually just, I just got back from a pheasant hunt in South Dakota with a bunch of the, my fellow teammates and classmates and, and just you go right back to the way it was back in 1988, 1987. So it's good times. Uh, I would have to uh, echo uh, Chad's sentiments. Um, you know, the, the, the bonds and the, the friendships that were formed, you know, upon the field of friendly strife, um, you know, are, are, are everlasting. And, you know, we call it the brotherhood. Uh, you know, it's the, the Army Football Club, and I know Air Force has a very similar club. But, you know, these bonds that we have and friendships that we have are everlasting. I just was uh, spent the weekend down in Atlanta with uh, I saw James Brock on here, you know, spent the, spent the night over his house doing a military charity event called uh, Johnny Mac, but, you know, four or five football players there. Uh, it, it just seems like uh, those types of engagements with my, uh, with my, my football teammates never end, whether it be in Atlanta at football games or whether I'm on a, a, a text thread, we're always talking, we're always making sure uh, and taking care of one another. So, uh, yeah, those, but there are some special plays out there. Um, uh, never forget, you know, Reggie Fullwood, you know, recovering a fumble in the end zone against Tennessee. I was pulling it out, but it's funny. Most of the stuff you remember are things that other people do. It, it brings me a lot of joy. Somebody like Dave Shire, uh, linebacker, uh, outstanding linebacker for us, pretty much missed his entire senior year. Uh, with uh, knee surgery, but came back for Navy and had 18 tackles. I think I was just as happy for him as uh, as we were beating Navy that year, just for him to come back for that one game and have such a phenomenal game. Yeah, Rob, I'm, I'm going to piggyback, Brady. I, I would say the one game that I would remember that was ingrained in my mind was when we played in my sophomore year, 86, 80 five season when we played Notre Dame at at Falcon Stadium and this is where the great my hero as far as Air Force Academy football players is concerned Terry Mackey who actually played behind me as a linebacker my job was to protect Terry to keep the uh, offensive lineman off of him but he had 30 tackles that game and this is the game where we were down in the fourth quarter late in the fourth quarter and Somebody had to make a play. Terry goes in, blocks the kick. A.J. Scott, our, our, our safety, picks it up and runs down the sideline, score the touchdown to go ahead, win the game, and to go ahead. And that whole place was just rocking. But, you know, I remember Terry, you know, that game where we were roommates on, on when we traveled, but then I, I flash ahead forward four years or whatever. We're in northern Iraq, a flying out of Insulik and provide comfort. Terry's on the ground as a combat controller and he's up and, and I'm doing above the head, doing my thing as a, as a A-10 pilot. Hey, Chad's at you. And I just had that same feeling, Terry, I'm protecting your ass again on the ground, just like it was back in the old days. But man, uh, and again, Rob, it's, it's all about relationships, isn't it? Again, the guys that you played with, the guys that you served with are lifelong. Those relationships are for a lifetime. I agree. I agree. You know, Terry, you brought up Terry, you know, he and I were in special ops together and it was great because we played in the hula bowl together and we kind of hung out there. Obviously I didn't know him that well, but we had a great time at the hula bowl. And then I end up, he's a, he's a, uh, you know, combat controller, you know, with STS 24th STS, I'm at the 160th and we're doing exercises together all the time. We're hanging out and, you know, we became good friends. So it, it's not just, you know, it, it's that bond, not only at your own academy, but it, it definitely crosses over to the other academies as well. Exactly. It's, it's proof that cats and dogs can live together, right, Rob? 
exactly. <laughs> Didn't Bill Murray say that in Ghostbusters? Yeah. <laughs> Plays right Guys, I, I love hearing these stories, and thank you for your patience, where not only did I froze, the internet kicked me right out of the, you know, our own webinar. So I'm um, back, and, and uh, Rob, would you, is it okay if we go back and, and show that film again one more time? And look, if the film's not good enough, it's just going to boot me right out out of here again anyway so um with your blessing can we go back to it yeah yeah i guess huh yeah yes. it wasn't moving i thought that was real speed for me <laughs> <laughs> all right well guys uh brady give me a heads up if it you know on the um you know if, if this thing is static or not here and uh i'm gonna go ahead and rewind this where we were at okay is that choppy Let's keep it good, Harrison. Perfect. So let's go back and look at this. I love this play here. You know, talk about just doing your job and, and creating a key play here to get let this thing spring. If we look at Rob at the top here, he's blocking down in this veer scheme. And here he is just setting a wall. And watch how he just gets in the way here of 38. Uh, gives him a little chin music, too. Looks like Rob looks like you busted his jaw for him. Big touchdown. Now that's this is the peach bowl. Yeah, the the joke on that play was that Donnie Smith, uh, the all American guard, he always he always kids Rob Healy that uh, you know he didn't hand off the ball to him and let him score the touchdown. You know, Donnie's <laughs> an offensive guard, but you see Donnie kind of leading and then I always joke Donnie Donnie beat him to the end zone but uh but uh yeah that was uh you know typical release inside of the linebacker pulls then I would go I release down and then you know go for the safety perfect seal and then here again like this is just if you can watch Rob here he's the tight end at the bottom of your screen here we know when it matters you know we got this goal line play first and goal and look at him just dig out right here. Just getting low and talk about, look, the finish. Still finishing. You know, Coach, we scored the touchdown three seconds ago, and you're still driving this guy to the back of the end zone. Here we are again, junior year for Coach Dickerson, playing tight end. Springing another big play. Okay, so we're going to talk about selfless service. The, the clips we were just watching, Rob Dickerson was playing tight end. Now here he is. He gives up the skill position number, number 80, for number 77. Now he's got both hands in the ground playing offensive tackle. Now, how, how did you make this transition here, Rob, and why did you do it? Um, that was, uh, my senior year. Um, you know, we had expectations for a great season and started off, uh, extremely well, uh, with us beating Syracuse. Unfortunately, we had some injuries. I see Ed Schultz on there. You know, he was a starting, uh, offensive lineman and, and we, by our third game. So we beat Syracuse our first game, then lost to Northwestern and Wake Forest. But in those losses, we lost uh, three starting offensive linemen. And Coach Shuck, I remember we were at uh, Wake Forest, or after the Wake Forest game, you know, it just come up to me because me and Jim Brock were the, were the captains. And, you know, he was saying, hey, you know, you know, we really need to step up. You know, we're down three linemen now. We need to finish off the season strong. And, and you know, we're not that strong now at, at, at on the O-line. And I said, you know, hey, Coach, you know, what about me moving in the tackle? Uh, Mark Charette, you know, who was the backup tight end, he's ready to, you know, come in and replace me. And if we're down that many linemen, let's, uh, you know, let's move me inside. And he thought I was kidding at first, and then he realized I was serious. And he said, you know, hey, let me talk to the coach. And, you know, that was Saturday. And then Monday, uh, you know, Coach Young came up to me uh, uh, at, at the beginning of practice and uh, said, I hear you want to move inside. And I said, hey, if that's what needs to be done, let's do it. And 
I moved inside on that Monday and we played Yale that Saturday. And fortunately we were able to beat Yale, but uh, that's, that's, that's the long version of how it happened. Wow. That's amazing. And, and so if I hear that correctly, Rob, you didn't even really have a, an opportunity to like pack on an extra 20 pounds or something that happened in season, huh? Yeah. Um, in between the third and the fourth game of the season, um, yeah, like I said, we lost the Wake Forest on a Saturday. I moved the tackle on Monday, and we played Yale that Saturday. But, you know, it's, you know, as a tight end, I was a blocker. Uh, you know, I, I pretty much knew, you know, all the plays. I knew what the offensive tackle needed to do. So it wasn't that hard of a transition for me. Um, you know, I was pretty much a blocker as a tight end, uh, you know. And, and the other thing, moving into tackle, it allowed me to eat a little bit more at dinner, so. <laughs> well, you know, it's an, it's an amazingly selfless thing to do, you know, because for a lot of football players, there's like an identity that kind of gets wrapped up in your number, right? So it's not even just the move that's going in, like you're like, oh, you know, I'm number 33 or I'm number eight. And, you know, to be number 80 in the middle of a season, be like, this is not who I am. I'm part of something bigger, a team. Here's jersey number 80. I am now assuming 77. What was that like in your mind? Um, you know, like I said, I think uh, I, I think my I think my teammates. You know, um, I don't know. It, it to me at the time, it just didn't seem like that big of a deal. Um, you know, Jim Brock. You know, who was the defensive co-captain. I mean, given the same situation, he would have done the exact same thing. So it didn't seem like a big deal to me. And like I said, I was a, I was a blocking tight end. Um, it was an easy transition for me, but I, I did, I did grow fond of the number 80. Uh, it took me a little while to, uh, you know, come to like the number 77. And I, even to this day, uh, people have to remind me, Oh, didn't you play tackle as well? I, I like to say I was a tight end, but, um, but, but yeah, it was, it was a different feeling, but, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, hopefully it, it helped us kind of uh, turn the season around. And, uh, uh, and you know, like I said, uh, uh, that's it. That's all that's I amazing. Got. Hey, do you have a 77 jersey and an 80 jersey from the mid to late 80s shadow boxed? Uh, not shadow, shadow box, but I do, ha I do have a 77 game jersey. Um, uh, and, and an 80 game jersey. They would let us uh, buy them at the end of the season. Oh, man. Uh, super cool. And so now we're going to go and, and, and pivot here and look at some, a, a few of the many highlights of Chad Hennings here uh, playing. And we're going to see his evolution starting as a sophomore at the Air Force Academy and then going into his senior year and it just so happens the first clip happens to show the score of the peach bowl that that rob was playing <laughs> at the same time so this is the freedom bowl right no uh blue bonnet bowl this is the blue bonnet bowl here where chad is playing defensive line he's wearing number 87 here and this chad this is your sophomore year correct yes now when did you did you start as a freshman like when did you earn the starting role no i wanted to be like rob i started as a tight end and i had a, <laughs> the other evolution from there we had my freshman year we had a whack offense our defensive player of the year and chris funk who ended up being an f-16 pilot was our three technique we called it a junk tackle and he graduated so at that position you needed kind of a an athletic tackle individual that could move so they came to me spring ball or after the season before spring ball my freshman year then and said you know we're going to move you over to uh to be a defensive tackle and I said okay like Rob hey coach whatever you want I'll I'll do it because in high school I did play both ways you know going to a smaller school so it wasn't much of an adjustment but yet uh it was I'm trying to watch your ooh yeah that's what we call affecting the quarterback. And what I love about this play here that we're going to watch 
you, you get bigger, stronger, and faster right before our eyes. And this is one of my favorite, like, speed time lapse. That's a tackle at the top of this. And we see, look, the get off, right? You're making contact, but you're reading, right? You're seeing what's going on. You feel the double team. Now the athleticism is showing, right? So you're slipping back. And now you hit the old school swim move right over top. You break free. And here's that speed as you close and affect the quarterback there. And I just want everyone to watch that, that clip in your brain. Keep it in your brain. And now as we go and watch Chad's senior year here, well, coming up here in a bit, you'll see the, the extreme get off right there. Boom. It really just starts to like, just impose his will. I, I, I I mean, Chad, I don't know if this guy even has a chance on you right here. Like you're, you're, you're getting off the ball so fast. You got the club and the rip, club, rip, affecting the quarterback. You know, here's what I like to just kind of one of the coaching things in the off season that year between my junior, senior year, spring ball, and then even every day we would practice fundamentals of that first step of the read where just – improving that fast twitch muscle and that's what really helped me doing that because it's just doing the basics the blocking the tackling it was always the repetition and that's where uh, it helped me carry on to, to get that first step but it's also reading the guy and then the follow-on hand moves thereafter i mean this is kind of i don't wonder where the heck you got i haven't seen some of this stuff oh it's amazing you know you're splitting double teams here let's see if i can get this timed up right Okay. Okay. So that was, you know, you're starting to see Chad in college just really start to work that get off. That's amazing that you said that. And before we even go to this NFL clip, because you have a pretty cool story about this, I want to know, Chad, I have this question. How come now you're, you're lined up on the right side of the defensive line? And earlier you were on the left side. So they were like flip-flopping you. Were you playing a specific technique? Like, a, were you like always the one technique? Or were they saying, hey, we're going to put Chad on this offensive lineman and you just go abuse him? No, it was basically you played a three technique or a four technique was typically what I did. And it was based on defense and to try to exploit, um, either to try to get the one-on-one -on -one or um, – you know, exploit their offense just based upon whatever their formation was. So I, I, I went both sides. And that was the beauty of playing in a four, you know, four point stance is both ground, both hands on the ground. You could be the ambidextrous in that regard. And that's what I'm saying is it was so essential to those little things about taking that first step. If the offensive lineman would try to reach block, you know, taking that first step to reach him, or if he's, if he's blocking down first step. So it, it helped me as a football player react holistically from a, a, a stance standpoint to be able to react to what that guy in front of me was doing. Yes. I mean, that everything that we did was read. I mean, unless it was a, you know, a go technique where you're rushing the pass passer and a passing down, but everything else was hit him, read what he's doing and then react runner pass right thereafter. Yeah. You're doing a great job of that. So it looks like, yeah, they always want you in the B gap you're in a base over front most of the time. So wherever the offensive strength is, that's the side of the defense you're going to yeah, be. Yeah, that was a strong side tackle. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, and then what's really cool is, let's go fast forward here to the NFL. You know, you do your, your service as an A-10 pilot. You eventually get to the Dallas Cowboys. You know, you're trying to get on the field here. And you were known for special teams before you became the uh, Dallas Cowboy Ring of Fame defensive tackle. Talk to us how, how, yeah, this, was, how did this go? You know, like Rob, it was one of those things of, 
my first, I, you know, I made the team, but I was inactive for my first um, eight games. So the first season I was standing on the sidelines in civilian clothes. And I went up to coach Johnson and said, Hey coach, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, to be able to contribute to the team. I'll even play special teams. And that next week coach said, okay, we're, uh, you're running down kickoffs. So as a defensive tackle at whatever the heck I weighed, I was, I was on special teams and I was doing, you know, punt coverage, kickoff coverage. And my whole, you know, just funny anecdote, you showed that Detroit game. That was the first game that I played um, active during the regular season. And my whole goal was I just didn't want to be five, 10 yards behind all these DBs and linebackers that are running downfield as an offense or as a defensive tackle. And I was keeping up with everybody and I was getting down there. And my whole job was basically be the wedge buster, just to blow things up, be the human bowling ball. And I got down there and we're going up against Mel Gray, who was hall of fame return specialist for the lions forever. And man, I just ran down and blew up the, the, uh, the wedge and I ran right into him. Boom. We kind of both fell down first play, first tackle. And I'm like, yeah, I am here, baby. And it was, it was a great, great feeling. And that's was a big, huge confidence builder for me, but that's what I tell kids is, you know, for, you're telling your kids and, and as a coach too, it's, I left the game, you know, as a collegiate football player at the, the top all american outland trophy winner best at my position right but it's all started over my rookie year i had to prove myself and i had to i had to haul water you know basically do whatever it took just to get playing time so it's no ego just do whatever it takes to get on the field and to, to play oh there's no ego in that so you probably picked the less ego selfless thing to do in being the wedge buster on kickoff i mean that was so sacrificial that they banned it from the NFL now. And you were the one to raise your hand and say like, yeah, I'll go do that. Yeah. I got it. You know, the only person more like upset about that were the two guys setting the wedge on whatever opposing team you were playing, because as big as you are running, you know, free down the field, that's got to be devastating to look at. Yeah, man, and I, t I should show you my rookie helmet. I, I do have it here, and it's well, – hold on, I'll show it to you. If you can see this, I don't know if you can see – look at all this, the notches in the paint scraped. Yeah. Okay. That's from being a wedge buster. And this is an archaic football helmet, too. This is going back almost wearing a leather helmet compared to today's equipment. But, man, that's what – I'm proud of this thing. This there's a lot of battle scars and a lot of a lot of ring in your bell. Man, that is so nostalgic when I look at that. I mean, that really used to be a badge of honor back in the day. Was like the paint, you know, that used to just come off and uh, it just, you know, like you said, it's like a, a badge of honor, like the scars that you, that you're, you're sacrificing in the heat of battle. And so, what's really cool, you had one moment that was uh, really pride I think it's, it's really happy to see this you, you you have an official NFL touchdown and I want everyone to see this and I want to know Chad what was it like in this moment against the Cardinals here yeah, get this rush and then look like you're, this is going to be a sack and, and right now all you see is football and end zone what are you thinking I'm thinking thank God it's on the 10 yard line I don't have to run very far. It had to be a rolling ball of butcher knives. But you'll look. You do, the first thing I did, a, you do the cursory. You know, you do the number one. Yay! But um, you know, scoring a touchdown was really cool. But then I remembered this is literally what went through my head. What my high school football coach told me: act like you've been here before. So I took the ball and I ran over to the referee and I handed him the ball. And then I started to jog back to the sidelines. Then I remembered, hey, in the NFL, you can keep the football. So I ran over back over to him and said, sir, man, can I keep that for my own self? Because I'll probably never get a chance to score a touchdown again. And he let me have it. So and that's that. Um, and again, guys, the impact that you have on coaches, this was 20 whatever years later. And I remember what my high school football coach told me in, in that heat of the moment. Yeah, that's so cool. And it was also important to remember because – you hadn't been there before. That was your first, first time in the NFL. And you're thinking, coaches tell me, act like I've been here before. But, but I haven't really been here before. Virtual reality. Uh, 
Yeah. So amazing. So do you have that football next to that helmet with you? I've got it uh, somewhere here in my office. I don't know where it is, but yeah, I, I do have it. I don't know if I can grab it quick, but I do have yeah. it in my office somewhere. No worries. Um, super, super, super cool. Um, so as we go through this here, I want to, I want to position this back to you guys, you know, you've done so much in your life, right? And it's, it's so much fun to go down memory lane and then, you know, look at old film and remember that, Hey, you know, you guys were really good football players and, you know, you've done all the stuff, paying it forward. Uh, what excites you most about soldiers of sidelines? Like, uh, what motivates you to support uh, this mission? Rob, start with you. Well, um, I think we talked about it a little bit at the, the beginning about impact of coaches. And, uh, you know, and quite honestly, I've said this many times before, you know, Will Huff uh, is a good friend of mine, great person, great human being. Who wouldn't want to help uh, out Will and Harrison now that I've gotten to know you and Brady? You know, you guys are very dedicated to what you're doing. Um, so um, I'm all about helping and and an organization that takes, you know, veterans from the services who are interested in coaching, um, help are basically getting them certified to, to coach, helping them with placement services uh, so that they can go on and, you know, help, you know, and uh, coach and, and literally raise. I mean, that time that you have them out there on the field, you're literally like their parent as a coach, but you know, help develop our young men and our men and women that, uh, you know, are going to lead this country down the road. So it, it, it's a, it's a phenomenal organization that, uh, like I said, helps transitioning veterans uh, over to get to the sidelines. And, um, you know, I look forward to uh, supporting it in the future. And I'm uh, real happy that I got to, you know, to meet Chad, uh, uh, and help out uh, help out the organization and I'll continue to do so. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, what's your prediction for the upcoming Army Air Force game, Rob? I'll let my hat speak for myself. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I would have been disappointed if you said anything else. Uh, well, and, and you know, my, my, I, my hat's off to, to Chad as always, you know, uh, yeah. put my hats off to him. Be careful. Nah, it's uh, it'll be a good game. So, so over to you, Chad. Um, what excites you about the Soldiers of Sidelines mission, and and why are you supporting? Um, you know, doing this here tonight. Yeah, well, you know, a story. What I was really surprised at when I transitioned from, you know, the Air Force flying jets. My first few weeks in the locker room with the Cowboys, I was blown away that the guys in that locker room were they could care less about my collegiate career. They could care less about anything in my past regarding athletics. They wanted to hear the stories about what it was like, what it was like to serve. What was it like to fly jets? What was it like to be in, you know, in a combat situation? You know, and I go think about that. And I think as kids, as growing up, we all played, you know, soldiers. We played cowboys and Indians. We played, um, you know, you wanted to be like your favorite NFL football player. And that to me is, is what Soldiers of Sidelines about is, is those that serve have instant credibility with those young men and young ladies, I guess now too, that want to play football. They, they know that you have served in that, that instant credibility, that instant respect. You walk into that locker room and you know, you've, you've been there, you've done that, you've coached those underneath you, whether you're enlisted or officers, you had those people that you, as Rob alluded to earlier, during his whole career, he, he was a coach. And that's what intrigues me about this whole program is getting individuals that can use that skill set of what they learned in the military and it translates very well onto the gridiron. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm all about what you guys are doing. That's why I'm you know, talking at coaches clinics, talking whatever, just to share stories. But the impact, because I see from a legacy standpoint and a, and a mentorship standpoint, as coaches, you know, we all complain about our culture and our society today, but you want to turn it around. Coaches are the last bastion of, 
the safety net. That's a lot of these kids are keeping them out of the system are encouraging them to go into the military, go into college and to do great things and do something with their lives. So it's not just about X's and O's. It's about life transformation. And for me, that's what you guys are doing. And you're just, you're, you're doing it with excellence. And I just want to continue to encourage you to keep it up. Well, thanks, Chad. We will. And, um, you know, you just really articulated the massive ripple effect that we all have. Like, it's a, we're all doing this on this call together, you know, so we get to go down memory lane, but really what we're doing is talking about the values that our society needs right now, our young athletes need, uh, that the military represents, right? It's, it's selfless service. It's, it's what the theme of this entire webinar has been to this day. And, you know, every single person on this call can cast their stone in the water to create this ripple effect so that we can create an army of thousands and thousands of incredible soldier coaches influencing millions and millions of young athletes that maybe can one day grow up, join the service and follow in the footsteps and be the next Chad Hennings, be the next Rob Dickerson, um, you know, and lead our country. And it's just it, it's so heartwarming to see you guys uh, get on this call, have this conversation, and then continue to have this effect you have uh, in your community right now. Um, so, Chad, you didn't tell me, though, who you think is going to win in this Army Air Force game. Hey, I'm, I'm going with the boys, the, the Fighting Falcons, you know, of course. But, you know, <laughs> Rob, we have both played in these games before, and it matters not what either team's record is. It's, it's a freaking battle. I mean, it is a battle royale. And I was able to, uh, I, I did a press conference here yesterday with the, uh, both coaches were there and the Lockheed Martin, the, the sponsors were all there. And, and my remarks to them is that this game is, is not just for the young men on the field. This is bragging rights for every active duty. This is for every veteran that's out there for their prospective branch of military service to say, hey, you know, we topped you this year. We got you this year. But I'm going to be in Rob's suite at the game. He's going to buy the first <laughs> drink, and then we'll probably be watching the game together at some point in time. Anyway, that that's that's the brotherhood. And, I mean, and that's the beauty of it. And I run into a lot of, you know, former Navy guys and Army guys, you know, around the Dallas area here. And I, it's, it, it is a brotherhood, man. We fight like cats and dogs. It's a sibling rivalry, but Katie bar the door when somebody comes against this man at the greatest fighting force in the history of mankind. And that's, that's what this is about, training these young men to go out there and to be warriors. I love the brotherhood too, you know. Um, everyone just coming together. You know, the folks that I've played against who have developed these longtime friendships with, and it's the best part about sport, right? Because these moments just transcend everything that's going on personally because it's just bigger than ourselves and you know just so you know everyone knows on, on this call like this is free and all of our services are free thanks to all of our generous donors and sponsors so everyone who has donated to soldiers to sidelines to make this happen thank you so much and i just want you guys to know too we we do a big event every year in fact celebrating the ripple effect of the impact we have. We do something called the Legacy of Leadership Dinner. And this past year, we just finished it in February and we honor a person who is creating a ripple effect in leadership, in coaching, in business, and in the military. And then this past year, when we did it, uh, we honored Nick Saban in coaching who showed up. Uh, we had Steve Cannon in business. And then we had Colonel Gadsden who was, uh, uh, on these calls as well in the past in the commander in chief trophy series and a tremendous support of soldiers to sidelines and it was great and we're doing it again next year so march 27th mark your calendars it's going to be in washington dc at the ritz carlton and you want to talk about brotherhoods everyone gets together it's a great time the story continues we talk about the ripple effects that we're all creating in the communities and this year in 2023 march 27th we're honoring NFL Hall of Fame coach Dick Vermeil as our coaching honoree, Jimmy Reyes of Reyes Holdings, who is a uh, an advisor to Soldiers of the Sidelines as our business honoree, and another great friend and supporter of Soldiers of the Sidelines. Uh, we're honoring General George Casey, who is the 36th Chief of Staff of the Army. And uh, we're all going to get together. Uh, 
Rob was there last year, and he, he could tell you it's a great time celebrating and continuing this incredible impact we have. So before we go, Chad, you want to say one last closing remarks? Hey, guys, I, I just want to encourage you. What you're doing is a, is a noble pursuit. You've done it before, your noble pursuit regarding service to your country, but it's even more now the impact that you have on these young people going forward. So I applaud you for that. Keep it up and go Falcons. Yes. <laughs> Rob, you're, you're, you you got last licks here. What do you got? All right. All right. Well, hey, uh, you know, uh, we've already said it, uh, you know, support Harrison, support Will. Soldiers of Sidelines is a phenomenal organization. Um, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, helping veterans get to the sidelines so that they, they basically coach and mentor, you know, our next group of uh, leaders that are out there on the football, baseball, basketball courts. But uh, one plug for Chad Hennings, uh, you know, one thing, uh, you know, my favorite athlete in the world is Cal Ripken Jr., uh, great baseball player. But what I liked about him, he was even a greater human being and great example and as I've got to know Chad here, uh, hanging out with him here in Dallas, not only was he a great football player, but hell of a speaker, hell of a, an example uh, to, to those around him. So, Chad, thanks. for uh, Pleasure to be on here with you tonight. Um, I, I try to butter you up a little bit just to let you down a little bit easy because uh, go Army, beat Air Force. Love it. So awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great evening. Chad, thank you so much for your time. I love the stories. I um, appreciate you so much. Rob, appreciate you as always. I can't wait to see both you guys soonest. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just play neutral here. So I hope it wins in a tie. Right. And uh, let's go Jets. Because we are the salute to service partner of the New York Jets, and they've just nominated us as the salute to service uh, award nominee. So uh, everyone, let, let's root for the Jets, at least here for the next couple weeks. Night, everyone.